All right, hello and welcome to the uh, KCP community meeting Tuesday, August 3rd, 2021. Um, we have some topics on the agenda mainly to go over uh, discussions uh, happening in other forums and make sure that those are sort of known and we can talk about them and, and expand on them. Um, David, you mentioned in, I think in the Slack, that you had started embarking on the quest journey uh, chore of rebasing our, our Kubernetes fork on latest Kubernetes. Do you have a, do you have updates or, or a, a plan for that or anything? Um, I hope to be able to start testing the final rebase probably tonight or tomorrow morning. Uh, in fact, I had to resolve conflicts, as you can imagine, each step uh, at each <laughs> commit yeah, of yeah. the history of our um, feature branch. Uh, but most of them were quite simple. Some others were a bit more tricky. Uh, but it seems that uh, there was nothing blocking, you know, where you would not be able to do the exact same thing or at least to do changes that have the same meaning. That what has been done uh, initially, so I'm quite I'm positive for now uh, on the result, but of course I might have some <laughs> bad surprises when trying to run that. But we'll see. Then uh, I step to the debugging. I switch to the debugging step. <laughs> but nice. but for now that seems to be quite uh, quite positive. Uh, is this rebasing it on the latest Kubernetes release? You're not you're not rebasing on to Kubernetes head or anything, right? Well, uh, for now, I uh, tried to rebase uh, to rebase on master. In fact, the very last okay. question, which we could decide to change. But by the way, I mean rebasing to a quite recent release of Kubernetes would would mainly do the be the same because I yeah. you know right. some changes were quite impactful changes were from the end of 2020. So maybe the I, I mean I don't have a, a strong opinion there, but I think the, the best would be for possibly to to depend on on Kubernetes to rebase on Kubernetes master. And okay. by the way, it seems that the very last uh, Kubernetes release uh, is very near to the master because there was a, a very recent release, one dot twenty three dot something. Or it seems that the, the commits nearly are the same, so uh, okay. we could switch to to this one also if we want. Yeah, I mean, definitely the the lift from 118 to anything recent is going to be pretty large uh, and not terribly different whether it was the latest release or or master. I think mainly the uh, my question is to uh, how often we want to update our work, how often we want to rebase, whether that should be a sort of continuous process or every release or something in between. I don't have a strong opinion. I'm just trying to yeah, get an idea. Probably, yes, yeah, sorry. Probably it depends on, on the strategy we have uh, regarding you know, reintegrating parts of it in, inside Kubernetes and, and delaying for other parts that are more complicated. If we stick, uh, it's my opinion, but I might be wrong, of course. But if we stick to uh, Kubernetes master as, as much as possible, and then we would be able more easily to you know, re uh, propose some easy parts to Kubernetes already. I I'm thinking, for example, at the, you know, uh, adding strategic match patch on CRDs, for example. This is quite a change that is not that impactful. That's not related to CRD tenancy or stuff like that. So this is the type of changes that might be proposed as first steps quite, you know, soon. And of course, there are other type of changes like CRD tenancy that really to be implemented correctly would depend on refactoring the whole CRD stuff to make it more dynamic yeah. and, and less static. Can you, can and you hear me? Yes. Sorry, okay. I moved oh. <laughs> off of earbuds, and they are still the worst. So yes, and the, I, I was saying that there are other parts that obviously would re, require some more refactoring. But the, the, the nearest we are from Kubernetes master, the easiest way we would be able to propose some changes. Even if yeah, absolutely. I, I, I think, uh, uh, right, the, the order of operations is get our uh, rebase relatively recent and then start figuring out how we can collect them into changes. I think you're right about the strategic mm. merge patch being a good first candidate because it's sort of small, less controversial, less, <laughs> um, uh, less uh, 
less difficult i think more more just sort of like this is a mechanical change we think we'd like to support that we think would be useful i think things like crd tenancy and making everything a crd are going to be not uh you know not hair on fire controversial but like uh yeah something we'd have to motivate people through clearly, uh, clearly the, yeah the level is not the same and and some of those um more impactful changes uh, also de depend on choices we still have to do because for example uh tenancy is based on you know um getting the cluster name getting the logical cluster name in every cases you know also yeah. on the on the various layers client side and and even etcd1 and obviously at some point we'll have to add and I think Clayton already thought about that, add a, an abstraction layer on that uh, to abstract the way we get and set the, the, the cluster, you know, the, the workspace name. So uh, obviously there would be some things to do uh, and, and I'm not sure that we can propose those changes, which were mainly hacks uh, uh, as is uh, to Kubernetes. So, so I was gonna add actually, like we're not done prototyping the, the core things that we want to prototype. Yeah, yeah. So the, sure. It's like the rebasing's goal is to reduce the friction so people can continue to prototype. And then when we kind of get that prototype state that can show like the three things working together, like, and then say like, here's the three things you want to do. Here's what we learned, yeah. We've written it all down. Here's the output of the prototype is, and we think that we should have roughly these set of interfaces here, roughly these set of interfaces here, and there's different audiences for each. Like, so I think yeah. we're just going to give it, I agree with. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The the uh, the the caps aren't going to flow soon. Uh, we still need to do the rest of the prototyping and and, and building it up. But uh, yeah. right, also updating the fork will unblock uh, things like uh, what Kim was talking about a few a couple of meetings ago. Yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, it's painful to have to be pinned to this old fork, and and it means we don't have to split apart our repos, which is nice. Um, yeah. And so like for minimal API server, one of the things that like was, uh, so we were like, we're trying to get to a point where we figure out what the interfaces that we would propose for minimal API mm -hmm. server or cube as a framework that we would propose upstream. When we get to that point, we might actually just have branches where we get to a stable point and then we rebase, but we have two branches. We have a feed, we have a yeah. feed branch per cube release so that, uh, other parts of like the like the say like logical cluster spins off logical clusters might just be on one branch but there's a reason to say like maybe we would actually just support or, or do the rebases on each so that you could you could keep up a life cycle on minimal and try things out until at some point those fold into cube branches at which point you wouldn't need those feature branches anymore whereas logical clusters might always be outside of cube but they rely on interfaces in cube or something like we don't know enough to know but yeah the the exercise of doing the rebase starts getting us in that mindset of like what would it just take to have multiple feature branches per cube release? Yeah, and also yeah, being as 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 near as possible to master uh, also, I mean, would force us to have the exercise of thinking in the current changes uh, in Kubernetes, what is going towards our direction and what is mainly somehow diverging from our directions. For example, I just stumbled upon the fact that um, uh, in open API, pruning defaults now is not done anymore when you build the open API, but when we you aggregate all the open APIs in the uh, aggregation server. And typically that's a change that's not really in our you know, direction because uh, now we don't use the aggregation server anymore to, to, to build uh, open APIs, but you, we, we all on the contrary bypass that to uh, you know dynamically take the open api that corresponds to your logical cluster so that's quite also useful i think to 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 be as near as possible as master because then we can you know track the changes and have an idea of where the overall um repo and kubernetes uh, you know code is going and and possibly try to be a bit pro proactive on the ongoing ch directions that that could be taken by other you know stakeholders does it make sense yeah yeah that's definitely another good side effect of this is that by being up to date we will be able to track more closely what is happening there and be aware of them and, and mm. uh i don't think 
uh, I, it, well, I don't know, so it's possible, but I don't think there's going there's any changes happening upstream that will actively hurt us uh, like very very badly. But uh, probably, be I, I was going to actually has hazard um, experience we've had on this in the past is when so like OpenShift went through this for like the first three years of Cube, which was we would trigger things that would help us, which then created a ton of pain for us on the rebase. So like original versions of client go restructure, most of the initial API server to support aggregated APIs, like five different refactors that David or Jordan or myself did on, or Stefan, like various things. So it was like, I actually feel that the people look like, this is an area where, yeah, I, I agree with your thing, Jason, which is we're probably unlikely to be broken. We'll have to keep fresh in our head how to keep those things rebased. Um, it's very likely that the pain will be when we get an upstream thing, then rebasing and realizing we missed something, or you know, like so that'll be where mm -hmm. our pain comes in. So I, I probably would say getting doing the rebases more often, like twice a release, is actually a good habit to start getting into. And then having those branches, might we maybe we just want to do it now. Like we we try we just come up with a feature branch for the name of the release, not like master or anything. Mm -hmm. Um, or main or whatever, but like mm. literally 118 one, or whatever, we're going to 122. We're at 123 is out. Yeah. So yeah. create 123 and then um, like do it like every, like, what are we at? Every two months, maybe be like, hey, like, let's plan ahead to do the, the chunk and like halfway through uh, main branch development or whatever for the next release. Like it's a great habit to be in because then it just forces us to keep that fresh. Like one of the yeah. problems that happened early days with rebasing OpenShift on top of Cube was even at three month windows, the chunk of changes was very large. This chunk will be smaller and it's not changing a ton, but yeah. Does it, uh, would it make sense to, when you say something like we want to do this every couple of months or every like six weeks, does it make sense to automate this and even just have a job that tries to read it and emails you when it fails and emails you how it fails? Um, no, probably not. It, but it probably would be we write down. So either a couple of people do it and review each other. So you're building like muscle memory on. Mm -hmm. Like I think the thing David and I should think about is we have hacks in there. The hacks need to be fresh. David's gone and done it. I probably should do one where I'm like bringing it back in and then David should review it. And then we should probably have a couple of folks like Keep that patch set. Like we want to keep the patch set small. Um, probably what I would say is, as we explore some of the next steps on prototyping logical clusters or whatever, do we actually drop the old implementation commits and put in new ones, and then bring the feature branch history into line with it? Um, and then we, what we really need, I'd probably say, is the automation around the: did we preserve the basic scenarios? So yeah. The, normalization regressions um like a couple of virtual scenarios like that's probably the best investment versus the automation to go do the rebase because rebase is more mechanical than anything else uh yeah with with a set of test scenarios that we can automate we can perform a rebase we can automate rebasing it's mechanical it should always work if it doesn't work if there's some merge conflict we have to go like resolve then that's good to be notified of. And if it isn't, if there isn't a merge conflict, mm. we'll run the tests. And if the tests fail, we found out that something failed. I'm just trying to like, uh, uh, I hate, uh, I hate having to schedule things on my calendar uh, to remind myself to do something. I prefer a computer to do it and tell me when it failed. But but definitely like whatever. In, in reality, it's whatever uh, uh, David is most comfortable with and whatever you're most. Yeah, I mean. Uh... <laughs> For this first time, I think that since there is, you know, maybe even more more than one euro, uh, obviously uh, by hand is is the great. yeah. But, but then you, you know, if we do this very regularly, surely as as soon as we have at least um, the check of the you know demos as as preliminary integration tests, because we for now we don't have real integration tests, but. At least, if we have something to check that the, our basic scenarios and funding scenarios still work, and we can do that automatically, uh, I had a pending branch for that. Yeah, I then I'm I'm okay to to do that. And that yeah. set of tests, like I would probably think about, like what are the two things that you break? Like if if you saw it break when you rebased, 
write down what you saw break. We would put a test in for that. It is probably yeah, going to break sure. again. And we probably don't need more than a couple of tests um, right now because the goal would be to throw the prototype away completely and replace mm. with um, a more structured approach. Yeah. And a more structured approach probably is going to be like, well, what the scenario test might actually do it. So like, you know, simple go tests that just depend on local, that don't depend on a kind server or whatever, or stub out like big chunks of it. Something that's fa fairly self-contained that you're confident would work. I'd be okay if the core test passed, but then yeah, like there's a subtle regression. Those are just going to happen. That's going to be the hard stuff to find. I don't think those will repeat. Like mm -hmm. um, as cubes, the cube stuff that'll change, it's either our refactors to add things in the cube, like the mechanical stuff, it's easy to break stuff during those refactors. The core integration tests excluding clusters will work really well. When other stuff breaks, it's just going to be really hard to predict. I think that's where we would say just enough of a basic test that you can get over it. And then if we still have a bug by the end of prototyping, when we start thinking about normalization, normalization should have a pretty rigorous um, test suite around normalization that's able to be used independently. That's where spinning that off, be like, look, we just don't ever, like when someone comes up with a new way to use CRDs or adds a new field or whatever, mm. that's happening in, in an upstream context, wherever that normalization library framework tool lives and flowing downstream to us. Yeah. Even, uh, uh, David, you mentioned the uh, running our end-to-end, -end, like our demo scenarios as end-to-end -end tests. I think we could even benefit from something even less, which is like just a test that creating object foo in namespace bar in logical cluster A and being able to do it in logical cluster B and them not seeing Yeah, it. sure. That's an even more basic test than what we need in the demo and and uh, doesn't yeah, yeah. any of the multi-cluster stuff that's also, you know, churning all the time. Um, yeah, sure. We could. And, yeah, yeah, we could. Obviously there are, I mean, at least in my uh, memory, there are some cases where, you know, stuff uh, could be found by the whole demo, for example, that, that uh, I did not find initially, especially because in uh, typically in the whole demo, you have both, um, you know, logical cluster isolation, but then also um, the, um, you use controllers that either are multi-cluster, uh, do multi-cluster watches, and also single cluster watches, which is what, what typically the, the, the splitter does, splitter only. Uh, points to one cluster and since uh, it's the whole point is you know uh, cluster phys um, cluster name management logical clusters and stuff like that that's quite important to be able to test both um class controllers that you know watch on the whole um uh, uh, on on all the the logical clusters and and typical and and you know typical or standard controllers that only watch on a given uh, cluster name that that's quite important to have both which is also, yeah. why I thought that that the the whole scenario uh, that was the funding one is, is quite interesting to to, right. to test. But but I might be wrong as well. And surely you know having simple things <laughs> would already be be great. Yeah, yeah. The, the just like the cube cube. I don't want to say failed at this. <laughs> you can <laughs> say it. You're in the space, you can say it. We, we went through cube failed at like a couple of things where we. We had loose integration tests and then we coupled them. And there was a lot mm. of strength in that, but it was it wasn't always hitting the things that we wanted. And then we threw those out or ignored them. And then we wrote a whole bunch of duplicate tests that were less covered, but we could um like the E to E tests ended up being somewhat pragmatic. I'd probably say it is an ex like cube is a coupled system, unfortunately. Cubelet controller manager, API mm. server because of the design of it and the fact that we split responsibilities across components, which had various trade-offs. Cube is a coupled system. KCP as a, as a logical prototype is not a coupled system. Mm. There is exactly like, like I, I, I think there's an anti, there, there, I, I feel like what we, I would like to inject is a little bit of an anti pressure on, let's have a whole bunch of scalable components that don't actually matter independently versus the simplicity of the framework will handle some of that but like it's like the moving parts right like mm. let's say just hypothetically we end up with the control plane and maybe an optional etcd connection for when you're running an ha mode and then um there's a set of uh you know like uh, the sinker maybe like or, or a component like the sinker that exists in some other library that shared as a global controller I don't know that we want more components than that unless we really need a really concrete reason, 
because every additional thing we run reduces our ability to run in like the simple contexts. Mm. So like thinking through that, be like, okay, well, we're not a coupled system. We should be fighting coupling into better, like minimal API server is kind of about being able to do things inside the cube API server that cube kind of as an evolved thing can't do. Let's learn, at least learn a couple lessons and say we have hard boundaries between the mm. components in the prototype between these areas, but those are testable interfaces. And they don't have to be EDE tested. They can be integration tested effectively. Um, it's something that Cube struggled with for a couple of mm. reasons. Um, and I'm not saying that the Cube EDE tests don't cover the problem. Cube is trying to solve better. I'm just not sure this is a great model for KCB. I understand. Yeah. Yeah. So um, uh, if you want engineers to talk for hours and hours, just bring up the concept of testing strategies. Um, but uh, <laughs> I, I, uh, I do think that having tests that cover specific pieces like the end-to-end -end test you know absolutely if something fails and the end-to-end -end test doesn't you know the demo doesn't run anymore then that's serious but that is also fragile because it implicates a lot of components yeah it sure. takes a longer time just something mm -hmm. that's like can i create the same object in two logical clusters and they don't interact that's great and can i watch across the logical clusters is a like useful uh thing to maintain that we can do and then we'll also, on top of that, after those tests pass, we run the end-to-end -end tests of, do, can we run the demo uh, uh, yeah. and, and detect, like, you know, is, is the whole system working? Great. But first, we have tested each individual thing. I, don't I think that's a great example. Like, demo is the end-to-end -end test. The end-to-end -end tests are the demo. We should have a couple of integration tests. And we're good until we hit end of prototype phase. And then be like, here's what, and every time we rebase and break something in the next yes. month or two, we write it down. Um, Great. So, so I'm very excited that this is ongoing. Thank you for all of it. I can't imagine how painful that must have been to update from 118 to uh, to nowish. And hopefully, everything keeps working. And well, I shouldn't. I should knock on all the wood so that it keeps working. But um, yeah, just, just sorry, uh, just so just to be clear, um, um, I started rebasing on master. Um, should we maybe, as a conclusion, maybe just not now, but just think about it? Um, I should have probably opened an issue, but anyway, um, do we want finally to rebase and master the the feature? You know, the logical um, logical clusters um, branch feature, uh, or or do we want, as we said, to rebase on the late, latest uh, for now uh, Kubernetes? I, I mean, don't, it would be quite the same for me, but I yeah, just have to know. I don't have a strong opinion. I don't have a strong preference, whatever you think is easier. I don't know if, Clayton, do you have a I probably prefer the latest Kubernetes because in the event someone regresses something stupid in, that, in main, I don't yeah. want to have to debug it. <laughs> yeah. Like the odds of, sure. like, like Cube spends four months, there's always something subtly stupid. The odds that it's in the Cube API server is low, but I'd be like, <laughs> The API server, if somebody breaks with priority and fairness, I do not want to be debugging it, mm. even though we disable parts mm. of it. So yeah. So it might be, uh, or do you think it would make sense to so uh, have the you know official feature branch that is depending upon from KCP uh, to be on the la latest um, Kubernetes release, and then have a pending uh, a distinct um, branch, which would we would regularly update to master. Yeah, that, that sounds right. And then, uh, then, then when 124 comes out, we can create one branch from there and keep the master branch. Yeah, yeah. Or at, at least we have the, the history of the change we had to do to accommodate the, the ongoing changes. Yeah. We can, um, uh, make them. And then the, the other part of the question, just to make sure I got it, was the uh, assuming that the KCP Kubernetes fork has, these, has this configuration of branches, the one that KCP KCP should depend on is the latest is our fork of the latest branch? I'm not sure that's right. Uh, of uh, Kubernetes, so this release branch, yeah, the, logical, yeah. the logical feature, the logical clusters feature branch off of 123. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and then that means that if someone of us would like to just test KCP on the latest master, we just have to, you know, change the commit commits yeah. uh, on they KCP to depend on the latest. Any need out of Cube that's going to require that. I, like I don't. The the thing is, is, we haven't needed anything in a year. Well, we do. We do need. We do need something. 
we do need KCP to depend on something more recent than 118 for yeah, yeah, yeah. No, sorry, sorry. the most recent stable feature branch and the most like the map the whole like tracking main it's nice to do but I don't think anybody should depend on it um, right okay. we should we okay. shouldn't yeah. Yeah, yeah I think yeah. I think we are in agreement and uh, yeah. Yeah, uh sure. we will uh, document this as we go as always um anyway great thank you thank you for that update and I look forward to seeing <laughs> Uh, to see more of it, I know a lot of people will be happy to not uh, to be able to use Ingress v1. Um, other things we have been talking about in in various forums, and I wanted to bring here as a uh, for visibility and also for discussion. If there's discussion, um, uh, Clayton and I have talked a bit about how logical clusters map to their physical clusters. Um, uh, specifically, logical clusters are supposed to be self-service. You're supposed to be able to just show up and say, "I have a namespace I'd like to give you." And for that logical cluster to spring into existence at the time it's at first asked for a thing and take that and do something with it. Uh, the question is uh, mainly around if this KCP instance is connected to thousands of physical clusters, how it, it probably shouldn't just randomly assign your logical cluster to one of these thousands of physical clusters. It should probably have some idea which ones are open to be given to and which ones have these constraints and, and limitations. So um, I think we are circling around some concept of when you create a logical cluster, uh, I think at first it might not do anything. It might not schedule things to physical clusters. You might have to say, by the way, physical, or sorry, by the way, logical cluster that I just created, you are now, you now have access to physical cluster A and B and C in these uh, locations with these traits. And then at that point, the sinkers will pick up and do the uh, sinking down to those clusters. Um, that makes it slightly less self-service. You can still create resources there, but they don't get scheduled to real clusters until you sort of enable them, you know, enable real clusters for them. Um, uh, so it's a bit of a middle ground between be being self-service and being sane. We don't want to. We don't want self-service to be like, no, great, I've spread your. I spread your resources across a thousand clusters around the world. If you want to <laughs> fix it, you have to clean them all up and like you know put them back to where you want them. That's not. I got you this deck of cards and I threw them all on the floor. You can put them wherever you want them. Um, so uh, I think that's a good balance, um, and is something we are uh, defining that config, defining how a logical cluster maps to a number of physical clusters is still TBD, but that's the direction we're going. Um, and there's all go ahead. And honestly, we might even be willing to say it's out of scope for the prototype, um, but we should pose the questions that that frame the spectrum of choices you could make, all the way from, you know, a direct mapping to a very complex policy engine with a set of different APIs and what are the mm -hmm. different APIs out there. I would say that's a that is a sub discussion for the prototype purposes. It's just enough to to generate the most ideas. And then um, we'll do a second phase where we go back through and say, which of these ideas did we not consider and which of these ideas don't work? Yeah. So for, maybe uh, if I can poke real quick, is it uh, in scope to think about the, certainly let's say I'm a user and I've come to KCP and I'm gonna, you create a logic, I want a logical cluster. I want you to stand up my workload. I'm a user that has access to cloud provider one and two are these logical clusters going to go into my cloud provider one and two accounts or going to push workload into physical clusters running in those accounts? Or am I thinking about access control of where that capacity for those clusters run? Or when I consume a logical cluster, there's some ability here that we are aggregating billing or other information for the physical clusters that are not under the customer, under the user, cloud account, but under some service cloud account? I would say that's a great question. Um, I think <laughs> what we're prototyping around is like that uh, logical clusters are a hard abstraction. You are not coupled to physical infrastructure with a logical cluster. Someone could choose to, which is reasonable. And so the default statement would be the mapping between what happens when you do things in a logical cluster is up to the the type of integration. So let's say you have a, a really simple controller that looks at that logical cluster and goes and creates cloud resources based on that. Um, it's probably the responsibility of that controller 
to fit into a larger system. And I think it would be reasonable to kind of describe how you could achieve that. Um, but then like the other one, which would be like, hey, I want to transparent multi-cluster. I want to copy deployment A down to two different physical clusters. Um, again, it's under the scope of each of those different uh, ways that you're using logical clusters to define it. And so it would be reasonable to say the logical cluster is hard decoupled from the cloud accounts and all those things. It's only what you bring to it that, that makes it. But for transparent multi-cluster, I think the, the naive thing would be it's pretty logical that if you're doing transparent multi-cluster, somebody needs to know that you've got one cluster in one cloud and one cluster in another, and that there's two accounts, and that that's tied to yeah. the logical cluster. And that logical cluster is then tied to some entity in a system of record for billing so, or accounting or ownership. So again, it, it maybe maybe this isn't the right time, and maybe it's out of scope. But I, I, maybe I'm I'm also trying to understand: has it been thought through? So in that model, I've got the user who is the consumer of the logical cluster. Does that mean I have another user who knows how? the logical cluster is mapping to the actual resources and that other user must do some prep work, you know, to um, the user working underground to hide all the complexities of the users that are above ground. It, it, it's kind of, I think that's a reasonable, like the Morlocks or... Uh, yeah, 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 the, the Edo and the Morlocks. I was trying to remember the right name, but yeah. And, and like, I think that's a reasonable, okay, so, so here's, and this is what the self-service was supposed <laughs> to be. Like, really do believe that Cube has completely failed at self-service. And that's okay, right? Cube had a much bigger goal, which was to accomplish uh, standardizing deployment APIs for most containerized software, and it succeeded incredibly. But everyone on top, and like this has been like, you know, talking with folks in multi-cluster working on this for like years is like, the self-service angle of Cube <clears throat> is a have fun, good luck, build your own mm -hmm. thing build it with primitives not designed perfectly to map. But they do, like, they, each of the primitives makes sense. Like a namespace makes sense, a cluster makes sense. Clouds chose to do clusters because it works really well for them and they can sell it. Um, some people went and did multi-tenancy or built crazy complex multi-tenancy into a single cluster because that worked. I do want to at least explore, and this is what that the, the self-service doc would be trying to capture is like, could you articulate something that captures the best aspects of cube and the best aspects of everybody's self-service system so that you could like create a center of gravity around maybe if you have cube this is a really natural way to do self-service and self-service implicitly underscores someone set that up for you a regular user doesn't need self-service they just go set up a cube cluster or set up GitOps mm -hmm. or run a bash loop or run a kcp instance like a hypothetical prototype instance that mm -hmm. does have self-service. I do think you should be able to bypass the self-service and get something useful out of whatever kind of comes out of this effort. Like I can just start a binary and I don't got to go do like, I'm wearing my admin hat, but I might need to say like, yeah, this is my cluster, this is my cluster, this is my cluster, it just works. So I think, yeah, you're right, Michael. The, the assumption is there is a separation between the consumer of a logical cluster the person who set up that self-service system and the rules and policies they've defined. Yeah. And the goal would be just not to make that so thick that you couldn't cut through it or so thin that you can't get the right level of, hmm. but it's actually a good self-service system. Okay. So does that also imply then that there's a design principle that the parameters of how the logical cluster is mapped down to a set of physical clusters should be explicit API constructs. So from a consumer of KCP, they're closed box, but to an administrator of a KCP environment, they're very white box, they're very programmable, they're very accessible. I think absolutely. Okay. And the white box, maybe there's two or three implementations <clears throat> of the white box at different levels of the spectrum of complexity where like, kind of the example that's in the prototype mm -hmm. today is we create a cluster resource. That's what mm -hmm. most people's multi-cluster stuff basically boils down to is like, here's a cube config, here's a cluster. And that has a lot of like, it, it works for a lot of the straightforward cases and you can use it as a primitive in a larger system. But I do think when you talk about, I would, I would love for the idea of self-service to remove the need to build a primitive 
that's reused in a higher system and instead let someone let a lot of people reasonably plug in their systems just like so like in cube if you want stuff to run on nodes with apps you've got an approach for it cube mm -hmm. kind of takes on that responsibility and you can do it through custom resources or daemon sets you can do it through on node interfaces like unix domain sockets or local ports i would say I would really love for the self-service part of this prototype and investigation to really hit that. The thing I was like, you know, what's the what's the thing that made Docker awesome, which was Docker pull or Docker run mm -hmm. had a Unix chunk that was reproducible. Cube was cube control apply. I have an application definition that's reusable. And then in theory, I would like that one part of the KCP thing would be how could we get to a level of you have this reusable building uh, core mechanism so you never have to think about subdivision or tenancy for any problem set. All you have to do is know how to add a CRD, write a simple operator, and plug into the logical cluster system. So it, that's maybe a little ambitious. Well, that, I think the idea there makes sense, but I think maybe the the tenant that we that I would hope we don't lose sight of is that there's still behind it. Yes, programmable. There, there's some set of mechanics that are defining how the tenancy model actually maps down to mm -hmm. real billable things. This is fundamental. So, like um, in Cube, we had emission control, and then um, we added finalizers, and then we looked at initializers we did webhooks instead and webhooks are an unholy disaster of a of an operational failure in practice for most people um initializers had some limitations but like like today in cube you can't initialize a namespace with a set of resources in a transactional way because we missed the opportunity to do that with like it's still tractable to some degree some people have worked around it mm -hmm. but you like you have to do something that basically says i've set it up now you can go and you don't have like a window where you can expose that i want to make sure that that window is built in in the way you're describing michael so that mm -hmm. someone can <clears throat> a, a, a reasonably flexible composable and controllable like quota rate limiting approval all that stuff they can fit it in in a way that feels natural I feel like we kind of have enough experience in the ecosystem. Part of this could be maybe we just get enough of it teed up so that we have a concrete that someone can play with, but then other people can say, oh, I don't like that concrete. We should try these different APIs. And I think like that's a level of flexibility would be while we might have an opinion, um, somebody else might come up with a better system. I want to figure out how to allow that better system to evolve alongside because this will be the first time we've really tried in a open ecosystem project around cube mm. to build a generalizable system for it. I think we'll get a couple things wrong. We'll get a couple things right. And so then unlike cube where the second system for cube is actually a little hard to do because of the way mm -hmm. that cube isn't quite modular enough. Could we try to find some of the modularity in the policy system, the APIs, like I, I like Michael, like in my head, I could kind of say like, I expect there to be a logical cluster that for an organization and the admins of the organization go into that and they add resources that then plug into the other logical clusters associated with that organization. And I can kind of see like terms that have been used and reused for PaaS for the past 12 years or 15 years or that exist in the clouds, like accounts and mm -hmm. billing accounts, all that. <clears throat> I feel like trying to get a broad discussion while having a very concrete couple of things to iterate on would then be the is a great trade-off because then we could say like, Let's go, let's go partner with OCM and with SIG multi-cluster and the folks at Huawei doing and Alibaba doing like the super crazy. I know there's some folks mm -hmm. very nested, like see if we could like find like a couple points in that spectrum and be like, hey, does this solve your use case? No, let's tweak it. Well, we can kind of have a couple running groups. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Uh, that's helpful. And uh Status on that prior that doc is like uh, I think a couple of folks I was shared a Google Doc around that we're gonna share to the community. Uh, I gotta I want to do another pass and like kind of like add some ideas, and then flip it out into a public doc. I'll share it with the Google groups and I'll link it and we'll kind of play around with it. I wanted to get some stuff on paper with folks. Um, sure, it's far from complete, so it's 
that's partial sh that sharing aspect is um, uh, just about to happen. Okay. Um, yeah. So uh, in addition to that policy mapping, what physical clusters, a logical cluster can you get to that also would be where we would hang uh, this no logical cluster in this organization can have more than this many resources in any of these physical clusters or uh, you know that that's where we hang quota that's where that gets very complicated uh that sort of affordance is where we open it up to do all of that other stuff and then make it hopefully eventually extensible so that people can bring their own logic to it um uh the quota issue goes to or uh makes me want to skip down to the terminology updates. These aren't like written in stone and you will, uh, you are welcome to come up with better terms for any of these things. I think there is a general sense towards moving from the term physical cluster to the term logic, or sorry, uh, so yeah, uh, that's great, words are fun. Uh, from physical cluster to location, where a location might actually map to the same underlying physical cluster. So a logical cluster can point to three locations Two of those locations might actually be different uh, resource chunks of the same physical cluster. Um, this further abstracts away actual underlying uh, resources in a way that I think we will find useful later. Um, uh, yeah, location is, I don't like the term location either. I don't like any of these, these terms, but uh, we needed something that was more abstract than a physical cluster. A physical cluster itself is an abstract thing when these things are on clouds. Yeah, there's a there's a thread that I was trying to tee off, which would be, all right, so like for transparent multi-cluster, there's a reason to abstract location into basically down to a label selector or a set of status. Um, I actually wanted to spend some time as that kind of plays out, which is say, is that an actual abstraction that could be reused by other components? that are not tied to physical clusters, but are instead tied to abstract concepts like geographies mm. or other types of schedulable units. So like there's the transparent multi-cluster is trying to place like uh, bin pack uh, loosely coupled workloads, lightly coupled workloads onto large things. So it's more development um, dense environment. There's another use case, which is I want to run a bunch of things for someone as a service and I want to place them into chunks. And that is a scheduling thing, which I actually wanted to explore whether the location concept, whether there's a commonality between the idea of like, um, I want to have a construct that you could schedule, place, and resource uh, bin pack chunks into chunks. And transparent multi cluster is a really concrete one, which is like, I want to put a workload someplace. Is there a commonality between that and the general problem of I want to make a decision. So let's say I'm running um, database instances as a service for someone across a large chunk of locations. Is there a way to, uh, we obviously want to reuse the cube scheduler and we want to have some concepts, but like Kubelet, there's no equivalent to Kubelet, right? Like the cube scheduler is very specific. Uh, this is something Mesos did reasonably well with offers and the two-level scheduling, but also put a lot on the user to go solve. Uh, I wanted to at least look at, as we go down this, is location or something like location, a concept that could actually be reused to do two things, constraints and capacity, such that you could actually do reuse elements of the pod scheduler we're already talking about like for transparent multi-cluster, like trying to do some basic scheduling that's at a higher level, constraints and placement versus pods themselves, but there's a little bit of a tie to pods. We could do that equivalent for like, I want to place a database instance of a certain size into a pool of resources. Instead of you having to write your own schedule or write your own mechanisms, come up with your own APIs, is location or something like location simple enough that you could reuse that in multiple places. There's a few projects in Cube, the ecosystem, that have done things like this. That's a, it came up, honestly, because if you have an abstraction, asking how broad that abstraction needs to be and what the, the limits on how abstract it could be, right? Like, is there a reason to like, we could just keep throwing more and more transparent multi-cluster use cases on top of location? Or we could say, actually, 
location might be enough to represent abstract capacity chunks for transparent multi-cluster mm -hmm. workloads, placing resources onto cloud providers, because someone's going to need that at some point. Like um, if you want to do, if you want to build any kind of service across multiple chunks of capacity, you have to have some mechanism like this. Is there enough thing there that we could say, oh, well, this is a concept that's reusable. And then the scheduler is also reusable. And maybe you don't run one scheduler, but you have a couple. But the idea being somebody wants to create a service on top of a logical control plane, then wants to do their controllers. Can they delegate scheduling and bin packing to something that's reasonably general enough? No idea, but that was a that that consideration was in my head. Um, so it's yeah, it's like placing things onto physical clusters that aren't just transparent multi-cluster workloads. And then placing things in the logical cluster onto completely opaque resource types so that people don't have to implement their own sharding and bin packing, but we could reuse the constraint system. So that was a side note to what Jason just described, which kind of comes out of that. Yeah, so, yeah, sorry. Go ahead. I mean, ahead. just to be sure I understand uh, the, the summary, <laughs> um, what you're explaining is that you know, um, location is not just um, a rename of physical clusters. It's it's a, um, the name or the concept for an in, in direction. In fact, you just name some con some abstract concept, uh, which will lead to the to the physical place where workloads have to uh, execute through some rules that that could be customized or you know implemented in several ways. The the location type might be. Uh uh location whatever name give it a name you want uh camels uh but it says i have 100 cpus and a terabyte of ram and i have the labels cloud equals aws location equals us east uh you know security mm -hmm. equals high or something so, then, so to poke on that a little bit certainly the notion of using labels on a set of objects to drive placement behavior that's been pretty successful with open cluster management today. When we import a managed cluster, the agent will auto discover data points about the cluster, including things like cloud provider region um, and a handful of other things, versions, whatever. But certainly that information about cloud provider region and vendor and version of Kubernetes, that, in, that type of information can be useful to help drive placement behavior with a placement rule, the, the, the abstract definition of my constraints, my conditions might express, you know, I need region in and then a list of like value one, value two, value three, so that we pick clusters that are from that region. It might then have an additional constraint of something like required replicas two. So now I'm effectively stating I need two clusters at least two clusters across any one of these three regions. Mm. So yep. I think the concept of location as a facade and abstraction and direction for something that's not one-to-one -one a cluster, that may be a subset of a cluster, um, is good. I also tend to think uh, that labels for placement are good. We could easily adapt the placement rule behavior that we have today to recognize labels on another kind that is not the managed cluster object, but rather a location object. So that would be completely feasible. It may also be worth considering do locations in this in this mental model have hierarchy? Is yeah. a cloud a location and a region is a location and a availability uh -huh. zone is a location? Yeah. Or yeah. do we simply think about location more generally as a box of available compute capacity, which probably maps to regions? Like at some level, it's a region. I care about this this workload existing within this specific region, and you know, a second region or whatever. And I think we should. I think we should avoid enforcing a hierarchy on these things because the, to the scheduler, we don't want we don't want the scheduler to know uh clouds and regions and zones and racks or anything you know, like that hierarchy of, of things to the scheduler it's just uh, a label which means nothing to the scheduler and a value which means nothing to the scheduler the region string could be any string if if it doesn't know what those things are it just so happens that the location has been labeled with region us east but the the string region carries no weight 
So, so things that you can still do with that. So even though, you know, we talk about the scheduler, I'm going to kind of map it into the mental model that I have around the placement controller. Even though we're, we're primarily just using labels on a set of objects, we're still able to use uh, match expressions and uh, label selectors to drive some pretty um, pretty advanced set of conditioning on it, right? I can I can drive an anti-affinity placement by knowing that I need a non-intersecting set of values for a particular label key. I can mm -hmm. drive um, the required distribution idea by knowing that I need a certain minimum unique values among, right? So like you can still do a lot even if the concept yeah. of the label and the key doesn't have semantic behind it. Yeah, and and I think like uh, part of the thing I'd like to see is that uh, transparent multi-cluster is concrete enough to say, I want a cube-like application that runs across clusters, a properly abstracted, what are the trade-offs, what are the limits, to get one angle of it. And the second angle would be the other use cases. I want to run, I want to run a bin packing service on top of logical clusters that is not, or on the on a through like a KCP like thing that is not creating um, workloads the same way because because I, I think with the database as a service thing there's a couple of examples where you actually don't want transparent multi-cluster you want bin packing you might want transparency for another set so it should be somewhat orthogonal but how do those two interact um, mm. that'll give us enough data to then combine with the OCM use case and maybe like we should you know, Michael, that would be helpful to talk about the different use cases and how they like what are the highest level conceptual differences that we can frame like I'm using administrative placement policy to make a set of decisions about these concrete things. Do they overlap with you know the same use cases or we actually make sure like I'd rather have six use cases for location and an understanding for each like this abstraction runs counter to this abstraction or if we abstract both of these behind it, neither one works as effectively to kind of guide that maybe there are two different location types. And honestly, a lot of KCP is a little bit of, we can do duct typing a lot more effectively. Um, Knative tried to do some duct typing and they ran into some challenges. Again, a goal for the KCP prototype and the exploration would be when duct typing is hard, what can we do to improve duct typing? And so having a scheduler where you could be like, yeah, I want a scheduler. I want to ask for a scheduler to run across these location concepts or mm -hmm. to map like a uh, a physical cluster or a uh, logical cluster capacity pool or a uh, cloud account and then have that intersect. that could be another controller type that emerges out of this where we say sure 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 and just for awareness we we have successfully implemented duct typing to drive placement behavior to integrate yeah. with argo mm -hmm. so the application set model allows us to express uh, to use the placement rule api express a desired set of places we want application configuration to be delivered and then with the application set it interacts with that in order to generate a set of decisions or cluster decisions placement decisions that then drive how ultimately the cluster lid and the manifest work and subscription controllers distribute the work but they're just at that point they're just the the assembly line picking it up from the source and putting it into the target they they are not thinking about what is the correct set of targets that's been decided and the application set has a duct type that allows us to then go to the application set. Hey, where are you placed? Does it make sense, um, according to what we just said, um, to to say that our location would be somehow at the cluster level? What you know you can find in not affinity, not selector terms, you know, something that that is you know uh, mainly. Yeah. and an or of of you know not selectors and this is important like not every use case may choose to overly abstract its location constraints mm. so like a pod goes under nodes one of the yeah. things with transparent multi-cluster that i think is a good shorthand that i kind of like is all a cluster is is a collection of nodes with the same labels that's it <laughs> this yeah this goes to the one of the bullet points here which is uh uh whether we want to reuse the node selector concept exactly verbatim that that when you when you give us a deployment with node selectors amazon it assumes a cluster that is amazon and then either filters that out or doesn't filter it out or whatever 
but basically assumes all nodes in that cluster have the same labels as the cluster, as the location. Uh, I think that is a, an, an open topic of, of exploration. And, and a hypothesis that we'd love to disprove is useful because, again, it's when I say a node selector, I don't know what nodes you have. And there's nothing that requires me to know what nodes you mm. have. Yeah. Right. Yeah. The intent is to abstract the workload from the nodes. Is the abstraction between the nodes sufficient? So, um, and things like anti-affinity rules and uh, honestly, service spread topology. The fact that service spread topology is in kind of invalidates, I think, or reduces the need for some of those constructs that Fed V1 and Fed V2 had, which were balancing, because they're very, very close to describing um, workload specific rules about placement that should cleanly move to, if I'm working over a set of homogeneous nodes, I can't actually tell the difference between a single cluster and multiple. Uh, I do have to drop, but I yeah, love yeah. all of these discussions because like, this is the stuff that I feel like the prototype was intended to generate was the examining the axioms and asking those questions about where we can couple existing solutions and reuse them like OCM, placement rules, uh, node selectors, learnings from locations and labels, et cetera. So I, this is going really well. <laughs> yeah. uh, awesome. Great. Uh, yeah, nice work, everyone. Uh, we will see you all next week. See ya. Bye.